Yes. Amen. Thank you. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the online voice of Ecclesia Teaching Center. Grace and peace to you. Thank you for joining us again. I'm Brother Michael. In one sense, we are continuing to look at various myths and misconceptions. And today, we are going to continue on with our series, our John 316 Lectio series. Tonight's lecture is connected to John 316 because it helps to bring clarity to the question as to whether or not it is God's will or intention to save everyone, which means today's teaching is going to be challenging to those who do not have a foundational understanding of the doctrine of redemption. Or simply, if you have not heard and understood the first three teachings in the John 3.16 Lectio series, Lectio 1, was entitled John 3.16, Lecture 2, Does God Love Everyone? Lecture 3, Does All Always Mean All? Hmm. You know, so it's, it's going to be a little uncomfortable for many and, and edifying for some. Uncomfortable because it is unfamiliar territory uh, uh, for, for some, but edifying for those who are able to see how the building blocks all fit together. Either way, we trust that the sword of the spirit is going to cut right through the darkness and divide asunder between religious traditional thinking and spiritual understanding. I encourage those of us who, are, or who already have an understanding to bear patiently with those who are testing the waters for the first time. In all fairness, it is not easy to let go of cherished beliefs, especially if those beliefs help shape their understanding of whom they see God to be. Put yourself in their place and you will see just how hesitant you will be too to let go of the old and lay hold of the new. You know, the, the Lord said it this way. In Luke 5, in, in Luke 5, 39, no man also having drunk old wine straightway desire it new. For he saith, the old is better. You know, so the Lord himself understood. But I'll give you an example. Think of how traumatic it must have been for Israel of old to abandon circumcision in favor of faith when for 4,000 years they were told over and over again that if they were not circumcised, they would be cut off from the people of God. Think about that. In Genesis 17, 14, it says, the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God literally had to reveal it to them. And clearly, he did not reveal it to everyone, but only to his elect. Just take a look at Peter's hesitation when God spoke to him in a dream about the acceptance of the Gentiles, you read that in, in Acts chapter 10. And when you've been told something all of our life, and it becomes part of your religious thought life, it is difficult to change horses in midstream. So what almost no one pays attention to is that those who claim that God loves everyone, wants to save everyone, almost never show biblical proof in support of their argument. Their argument is based on an assumption, an assumption that seeing God is love, he must love everyone, and he simply must want to save everyone. But this is human reasoning disguised as spiritual wisdom. It will become abundantly clear just how much the general religious understanding is not really understanding in the true sense of the word, but really echoes from a crowd that has lost its way. Acknowledging the truth is going to be a challenge, especially since there are men who secretly crept in whose agenda it is to overthrow the truth of God's word by corrupting the message of the gospel. 
This is why we need to know what was the conversation the members of the Godhead were having before the foundation of the world. For instance, did the Father tell the Lord Jesus to make sure to save everyone? Did Jesus see that as being the Father's will? We've already answered this question. You can read in, in John 6, 39 to 45. Next, does, does, does the Holy Spirit see it as his ministry, responsibility, to apply the salvation secured by the Son to everyone? What was the conversation among the members of the Trinity? We know we are speaking the truth when what we have to say lines up with and flows out from the ancient narrative, the pre-Adamic conversations that make up the covenant of redemption must form the doctrinal basis of everything we say and do. A good test would be to ask those who believe that God wants to save the whole world if they are aware of any pre-Adamic conversations in the Godhead. And if they are honest, they will admit that they never even knew that any such conversations took place. So all we are seeking to do is to speak truth. We are not trying to be controversial or to be novel. You know, you know, saying something new for the sake of saying something new. There is nothing new. All we, all we have set out to do is to speak the word in season and out of season. We have no control over whether or not what we say turns out to be new to the ears of most of our hearers. Our concern is not, is not with whether or not it's new, but whether or not it's true. It just goes to prove our point that so many churches have drifted away from the truth and have been turned onto fables. But before we move on to today's teaching, I would like to spend a few minutes, please, tying up some loose ends from our last lecture entitled, Does All Always Mean All? So bear with me. We have proved from a multitude of scriptures that all does not always mean all. The meaning is determined by the context. Let's look at, at one more passage, please, and consider the implications of misinterpreting the meaning of the word in the following passage. Let's take a look. Joel, we all know it. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 29. Verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Let's look at verse 29. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Well, what does this mean? Is God going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh without exception? Meaning everyone on the face of the earth regardless? Or is he going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh without distinction? For those who attended the previous class, this scripture should light up like a lamp. It cannot mean all flesh, the whole world, without exception. It has to mean all flesh without distinction. And seeing scripture interpret scripture, this is what the prophet goes on to explain. Remember, in the Old Testament, the anointing oil was only allowed to be poured out upon Aaron and his sons. If you were a member of another tribe or Gentile, you were not eligible to have the oil poured out upon you. The oil was holy and could only be poured out upon Aaronic flesh. All others would die. Now God says that the oil, which symbolizes the spirit, shall be poured out upon all flesh. And what does all mean? It means all without distinction. Well, let's take a look. In Joel, in Joel 2, 28 to 29, when he says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, it means regardless of tribe. Regardless of tribe. Let's continue. Also, it means regardless of gender. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, bless God. So regardless of gender, your sons and your daughters. Now, it also means regardless of age, your old men and you know shall shall uh, dream dreams and your young men see visions. Your old men and your young men. So regardless of age, regardless of age, 
Now, regardless of station in life, social status, it will be poured out upon the servants and the handmaids. You see, all flesh. And the Lord himself confirms the interpretation by outlining, outlining something in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. He says to them, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, not just in, in not just among the Aaronic priesthood now, not even just in Jerusalem, but in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. God is pouring out his spirit upon all flesh. See, the, understand what pouring out the spirit means. God pours out his spirit only upon those who are regenerated and only upon those who are born again. As a matter of fact, that's how you're born again. God poured out his spirit upon you. So you see, it is not happening to everyone. It is not all flesh without exception, but it is all flesh without distinction, whether it's Jew or Gentile, Scythian, bond or free. So the, the Lord showed it would not be in Jerusalem only, but in all Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth, all flesh regardless of Old Testament distinctions. Okay, praise the Lord. So, so let's move on to today's lesson, please. Today's lecture is another link in the John 3.16 chain. After all, John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world. The statement is true and cannot be denied. But what does it mean? That's the thing. You see, what does it mean? So today's lecture is entitled, in the John 3.16 lecture series, today's lecture is entitled, What is Meant by the World? What is meant by the world? When the Lord says that he was... He was given because the Father so loved the world. What does he mean when he refers to the world? Did he mean everyone on the face of the earth? We have already proved that this is not the case. But for the sake of those who may still not be convinced, let us use this space to give a reason for the hope that is in us. Amen. If we were to put forth a doctrine that goes contrary to conventional wisdom, it is our responsibility to put forth the proofs that support our position. Excuse me, amen. All things being equal, it is a relatively easy task to learn new material, but that has to do with straightforward learning. And by straightforward learning, I mean any situation where you do not also have something to unlearn. If you find yourself trying to unlearn while at the same time you're trying to learn, that could be a problem because your mind is struggling trying to determine what to hold on to and what to let go of. You see, almost as though your mind is trying to serve two masters. And if while you're wrestling with this or that thought, the speaker keeps speaking, it can be very distracting, if not discouraging. Amen. So remember, we all have areas of our minds that need to be renewed, some more than others. And the person you are sharing with is no different. If they have been taught, if they have not been taught, they will have large portions of their mind still under the control of religious darkness. And that is the nature of the carnal mind, such as the nature of the unrenewed mind. You see, never forget something. By nature, we love darkness rather than light. But the new creation person in us prefers light to darkness. But there are portions of our mind that still need to be renewed. And these areas of our mind will put up a fight against truth because truth and light are the same. So the areas of our mind that love darkness rather than light are areas that love error more than truth. These are the areas in which we find strongholds that resist the truth. These are the areas of our souls that prefer old wine to new. These areas form old wine containers that become difficult to overthrow. Let me show you how powerful it can be. The scribes and the Pharisees prefer to crucify Christ rather than to unlearn old wine doctrines and outdated traditions. 
Never underestimate the power of religious strongholds. Do not underestimate the unwillingness of the carnal mind to unlearn things that are based on religious indoctrination. The mind will put up a fight and refuse to give up the thoughts and conclusions it has become persuaded of. And it will be irrelevant as to whether or not these beliefs are based on scripture. And this is one of the main battlegrounds in the closing days of the age. Many professing Christians are going to hold fast to beliefs that cannot be found in scripture, and they don't care. And that is what makes room for fables to come in. So what, we are, what are we looking at today? What does the scripture mean when it speaks of the word world? Again, if we are going to interpret scripture based on the understanding we had while walking in darkness, we may find our interpretations to be unprofitable. As Christians, we need to depend upon the illumination of the Holy Spirit and seek to determine how the Spirit uses the word world in his holy word. Let me share with you what I believe is one of the main keys, not the only one, but one of the main keys to interpreting the meaning of the phrase, the world, as used in scripture. Let me share this with you. It's a simple key. You know, when you see the word world, think of either everybody except or everyone but. Everybody except or everyone but. Not always, but sometimes it happens. Let's take a look. The method we have used is very simple and will help us in our personal and private study of the word of God. As a matter of fact, it's going to affect you. When, you. when you're reading the word of God, you know, it will come back to mind. Oh, there it is. You know, so for purposes of this study, we have purposely omitted passages speaking of like the end of the world or the beginning of the world or the foundation of the world. We have only used a sampling. Okay, so let's begin. How does the Holy Spirit use the word, the world? Let's look at Luke 8, 16, chapter 8. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Remember what we said, everybody but, everybody except. So what does the word world mean in this passage of scripture? It means everybody except the children of light. Hang in there. What we're doing will become clearer as, as, we, as we move forward. Hang in there. All right? Look at John 3. Look at John 3, 17 to 21. In verse 17... The world here means the world of the elect. The world of the elect. If you have your Bibles open in front of you, John 3, 17. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, what does John 3.17 mean? It is pointing to the world of the elect. The purpose of God is to ensure that the elect are not caught up in the worldwide condemnation. Look at verse 18. He who does not believe is condemned already, okay? See, remember that faith in Christ is a gift from God upon the elect only. I repeat, John 3.16 says that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. But never forget that faith in Christ is a gift from God. And he gives that gift only to certain few, certain select ones. Let's let's turn let's let's turn to verse 19. You see, verse 19 says this. This is the condemnation that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Now, here is the thing. 
Man in his natural state of original sin loves darkness rather than light. Only the regenerate love light. No one does good. All of the deeds of the children of darkness are evil. They do not conform to the righteousness of God, even if they, they are very moral people. They still do not conform to the righteousness of God, and God sees that as being evil. Okay, let's take a look at, at something. Verse 20. Verse 20 now. Okay. Since everyone does evil, follow me, please. And I hope I, I can I can say this clearly. Since everyone does evil, we're talking about the, the whole unsaved, unregenerate masses of mankind. Since everyone does evil, it means that everyone by nature hates the light. And no one comes to the light. Please remember, it is Jesus speaking and he is telling us what he expects and does not expect to happen or to be able to happen. He is telling us, if we're listening, that he does not expect any unregenerate soul or child of darkness to come to the light. In other words, to come to him. Let's reiterate, every one of the sons and daughters of Adam without exception hate light and will never, ever come to the light. Note the main reason why they are violently opposed to the light. The Bible says they don't come to the light, you see, lest their deeds are reproved. Lest their deeds should be reproved or exposed. In other words, in other words, they hate to be corrected and hate to have anyone tell them what they can and cannot do. Ladies and gentlemen, this was our condition before we were born again. Every man, every single person falls into this category. This was us before the grace of God. This was us before we were born again. We hated light. So we're going to come upon a question now in, in, in a minute. Okay. So, they hate to be corrected and hate to have anyone tell them what they can and cannot do. Now look at verse 21. Let me just get verse 21 here. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God or they orig originate in God. But now here's the question. Very easy to overlook this. If all without exception, if all unregenerate men and women hate light and love evil, how is it possible that there are some who do the truth? Verse 21 says, they who do the truth come to God. How is it possible that anyone at all can do the truth? No man on his own can do the truth. This is impossible. All men by nature are in darkness and all men are under the dominion of original sin. This is what Paul tells us again in Romans 3.9. What then? Are we better than they? Are we Jews better than those Gentiles? No, in no wise. For we have proved before that both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under the dominion and authority of original sin. They all suffer from a want or a lack of original righteousness. And they all suffer from the corruption of the whole nature. You see, we need to be able to appreciate that. They are all gone out, all, all gone out of the way. They are together, meaning all together, become unprofitable. There is none, none, you see, that doeth good. No, not one, all. Everyone is, has gone out of the way. No one is profitable. So then how can anyone end up doing the truth? See, here's, here's what I want to do. I want to paint a picture of utter and complete hopelessness and helplessness. Before we were born again, this was our condition. Hopelessness. 
we were without hope and without God in the world. So for any of us on this call tonight who are born again, we are born again by the grace of God. We were in a situation where we were totally helpless within ourselves. We were under the dominion of sin, under the dominion of, of, of a lack of original righteousness, and under the dominion where our, uh, there's a corruption of our whole nature. Nothing in us wanted light. We totally, totally hated light and hated truth. So then how did we ever come to the point where we were doing the truth? By the grace of God. God stepped in and did for us what we were unable and unwilling to do for ourselves. And that should cause us to rise up in praise and adoration. You got to understand, we all suffered from a want or a lack of original righteousness, and we all suffered from the, from the corruption of the, of the whole nature. You see, we became unprofitable, which means nothing we did was acceptable to God. It was unprofitable, nothing, you see. It will always create a deficit. Nothing that we did. So, and, so because of the corruption of the whole nature, everyone without exception became unprofitable to God. In other words, there is none that do it good, no, not one. So if there are none who do good, because all have a corrupted nature, how did some manage to do the truth? The unregenerate soul cannot do truth because it is violently opposed to truth and light. Only the regenerate can love light and do truth, but no one can regenerate themselves. And you certainly don't regenerate yourselves by walking the aisle and saying a sinner's prayer. That's madness. So it means that God selects some out of the darkness to be sons and daughters of light, and only those will come to the light. That's why Jesus said in John 6, 37, all, thank God, that the Father gives to me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Okay, all right. Let's turn to John 6. We're in John 6. Let's turn to verse 33. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Wait a minute. What does the phrase the world mean in John 6, 33? What it means, the elect only. He gives light to the world. He gives life unto the world. It means the elect only. Look at, okay, look at, look at chapter 12 and verse 19. Chapter 12 and verse 19. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. What does the word world mean? It means the world of believers. Believers only. That's what the word world means in this context. Look at John 14, though. Verse 17. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot, cannot, cannot. Does anybody un not understand what cannot means? You see, because if you're out in the world and you cannot receive the spirit of truth, you cannot be born again by making a decision or by understanding something. You just can't receive because only if with the spirit of God in you can you understand spiritual things. Other than that, to the natural man, the things of God are total and complete foolishness. So the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seed him not, neither know him, but ye know him. Who is this but ye group? Well, the world there means the world, uh, it is true of everyone but the elect. The world cannot receive, that's true of everyone but the elect. Because it seed him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So now you have you and the world. And what does the word world here mean this, in this instance in John 14, 17? Everyone but the elect. Look at, look at verse 19. Yet a little while and the world see it me no more. <laughs> what does the world mean? This is, this is still the book of John. 
What does the word world mean? He is talking about everyone but the elect. The world seeth me no more. Who will be those who do not see Jesus anymore? Everyone but the elect. Get that? Let's, let's turn to chapter 15 and verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. So in John 15, 19, who is the world? Everyone but the elect. Every single person on the face of the earth but the elect. All right, let's turn to John 17. I pray for them, I pray not for the world but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. John 17, who is he praying for? Huh? You see, I, 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 I pray not for the world, okay? I'm praying for everyone except the world. I'm praying for believers only. Do I, did I get that right? I pray not for the world but I'm only praying for believers. Thank God for that. Look, look at John 17, 25. O righteous Father, the world has not known you. What does the world mean? We stood in John. What does the world mean? It means everybody but believers. Everyone but the elect. See, the world has not known you. Let's go to 1 John now. Same John, but different book. 1 John 2, 2. Something we need to clarify. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. You see, 1 John 2, 2 is a word of clarification for those Jews who misunderstood the scope of Christ's redemption, that it was not meant for Jerusalem and Judea only, but for Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Let's look at something else that is just as troubling. In 2 Corinthians 5.19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and had committed unto us the word of reconciliation. But what does the word word mean? What does Paul mean in 2 Corinthians 5.19 by the world? He means the world of believers. If, see, if God is not imputing someone's trespasses unto them, it means they face no judgment because he was in Christ reconciling them to himself by life and death. Now, can we truly say that God has reconciled the world and is not going to impute their trespasses onto them? If you believe that, you believe in universalism. Everybody's going to be saved. You see? But can this be true of the world of the ungodly? God is reconciling the world unto himself. But let scripture interpret scripture. You see, let verse 18, this is verse 19, but verse 18 clears it up. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, verse, verse 19 says, God reconciled the world. Now, verse 18 is, is being specific as to what portion of the world did God reconcile himself to? And that portion is called us. He has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and had given to us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, those of us who understand the principle of reconciliation, we go out and share with others who are not born again, trusting that God would open the eyes of their understanding. 
So you see, verse 18 clears that up by revealing that it was us that God reconciled us to himself. But, but, but who exactly will reconcile? Let's go back one more, one more uh, passage. We're going to go to, to verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So we see the ones who are the recipients of God's reconciliation belong to the new creation. They do not have their trespasses uh, um, sort of counted against them. They don't by the grace of God. So it's the new creation. Okay, let's turn please to Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Noah warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he condemned the world. I mean, if the world means every single person on the face of the earth, you know, but in Hebrews eleven seven, 7, the world here means everybody but believers. He condemned the world, everybody but believers. Look at James, look at James 4. Look at James 4. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Well, what is James, what is he referring to? Everyone but believers. Friendship of the world means God is talking, listen, God says, don't be a friend of the world. Well, Lord, who, who is the world? Everyone but believers. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 2. In the days of Noah, spared, God spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world. Well, what world? Ah. You see, Peter now, Peter actually clarifies this and he, he lets us know, here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about everybody but believers. I'm speaking about the world of the ungodly. Everybody, every single person but believers. The flood came up upon the world of the ungodly. Now, if there is a world of the ungodly, there is a world of the godly, made up of the elect, the children of the kingdom, the, the, the children of light, just as there are two creations, the old and the new, just so each creation resides in its own world. Just as there are two atoms, there is a world pertaining to each atom. You see, there's a world pertaining to each atom, and depending on the world you belong to, you shall experience either the wrath or the love of God. So, brethren, which world do you belong to? And our, our, our uh, loved ones, our friends and our families, which world do they belong to? Because the Bible says something. The very world that, that, that a lot of people say, no, 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 God loves everybody in that world. Jesus said that they are condemned already. They are condemned already. You say, well, no, 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 no. What that really means is that if, if they're going to be condemned, if they don't believe in Jesus. No, you don't understand something. Jesus is the one who gives you faith as a gift. That's why we are told in Hebrews to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. That's why we were told in Ephesians that it is by grace that you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. So you have to understand the people who are teaching others to wait to make a decision for Jesus are making a fatal mistake. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can 
cause you to enter into heaven because he is the door. He is the only one. He has the keys of hell and of death. So we have to be careful which world we belong to. You see, the, the born again, we belong to a world called the kingdom of God. So whichever world we belong to, we shall experience either the wrath or the love of God. Because I'm going to tell you, what a lot of people miss is this. They say God loves everybody, but here's, here's the thing what people miss. God's love never fails. So if God loves you, he never stops loving you. Think about that. And may God Bless you with understanding in Jesus' name. That brings us to the end of tonight's lecture. I trust you were edified.